بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة نصح الأمة فصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Uh, in the last circle we started talking about Ulu of Allah Azza wa Jal upon his creation Ulu by that we meant elevation in every sense of the word And we mentioned Ulu with that <coughs> Which means that Allah himself in essence be elevated upon his creation Ulu al Qadr Allah being uh, 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 elevated above his creation in terms of his majesty Allah being elevated above his creation in terms of his power and it is we also said that it is from his attributes of the essence attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of different kinds different types attribute of the essence and attribute of actions <coughs> For example, what is the attribute of action? Yes, that is a name that is also an attribute of action in a sense that uh, that is also an attribute of essence. But an attribute of action, in particular, for instance, for Allah to create, yeah, that is an attribute of action. An attribute of essence is an attribute that subsists in Allah's essence. An attribute that exists in Allah's essence. <coughs> Allah's existence. So, the fact that Allah rose over the throne. He rose over. Is that an attribute of essence or attribute of action? Action. MashaAllah, you're having fun over there, aren't you? Serious, the love and end. <laughs> hmm? Holiday, bank holiday. <laughs> so, <coughs> attribute of action, attribute of as- essence. And we also said that the sifa of ulu, Allah's elevation above the creation, is that an attribute? Of action or essence? Essence. Meaning Allah in His essence is above the creation. So that is an attribute of essence. And we also said <coughs> that this attribute is affirmed by the aql and the naql and the fitrah. What does it mean? Aql and the naql and the fitrah. We know this attribute by aql, intellect, reason. We know this attribute of Allah by naql, by the text. The Quranic text and the Sunnah of the Prophet And we know the fact that he's above the creation by our fitrah. Yes. So is, is that with regard to attributes of action and attributes of essence? No, we're talking about ulu. Just ulu. Okay. okay. The elevation of Allah above his creation, which is an attribute of essence. This is proven by aql and naql and fitrah. It's proven by reason. It's proven by legal text from the Quran and the Sunnah and it's proven by our own fitrah. Now, <coughs> just to remind ourselves, someone give me a proof, a rational proof for God's elevation above the creation. How can you reason that God must be above the creation? Alaikum <laughs> Well, let's say a person argues, you know, Allah could be to the right of the creation. Allah does whatever He likes. Sure. 
Come closer, bros. Come closer, inshallah. <laughs> Drag that guy behind you as well. <laughs> no, come, come closer. <laughs> like form a proper circle, yaki. <laughs> I'm not going to bite you, man. Don't worry, you, you won't catch my cold. Don't get the clothes. Huh? Just enough, just enough. Yeah, is this, that's one of his names, Most High. Yeah, that's one of his names, like a reason, logical reason. For instance, when I say reason, meaning you forget about the text, you forget about fitra or anything else. Just use pure reason to suggest why is God above or below. Why, why can't God be inside? You know. <coughs> so, if you, if you all believe that God exists, which we all believe God exists, yeah. Then he has to, his existence is, is real. His existence is real. Now, either we say God exists in his creation or God exists outside of creation. Or let's say when, when there was no creation, when, when God created the creation, he either created the creation inside of him or outside of him. Right? These are the only two possibilities, rationally. You, God cannot, cannot neither create the creation inside of him nor outside of him because that means the creation doesn't exist if you say that creation neither exists inside Allah nor outside Allah that means the creation doesn't exist so when Allah created the creation he must have created him either inside of his essence or outside of his essence which of the two possibilities is correct? outside Allah created the creation outside of him right? if Allah created the creation outside of him <coughs> then it has to exist in a direction. Yeah? Creation has to exist in a particular direction. Now, creation, there is no comparison to it in, in, in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you look at the earth, right? Earth is just like a little, no, it's like a dot. Okay? And a dot is usually directionless. And whichever you are on this round earth, God always going to be above you anyway even if you are here you see when it comes to the universe directions become irrelevant yeah? and wherever you are on the globe you will refer to Allah as above you and he will be as far as direction when you say above we don't mean you know we are only talking about from your perspective okay because what is above to a person who is let's say below the globe on the, the above for a person on the uh, above for a person who is on earth is not the above for a person who is on moon yeah when a person is on earth and he's looking up to the moon he's looking up but when a person goes to the moon he's not looking down at the earth he's looking up right so up is really Relevant in terms of where you are All these directions Become <coughs> Irrelevant in a, in a grand scheme of things So from that perspective Wherever you are in the creation Allah is going to be above you anyway If Allah created you outside of him he, He's always going to be Above you Because you're just like a speck In a grand, grand scheme of things Right So this is one rational argument As to why God must exist in the above direction and not any uh, not anywhere else. That's obviously the aql. That's of the aql. The naql. There's many proofs for the fact that Allah is above the throne. Can someone quote me one proof from the Quran? Above that Allah is above the creation. One proof from the Quran that Allah is above the creation. Uh, so the Kursi, uh, where the, where the Kursi like yeah, but there are, there are more explicit evidences from the Quran which explicitly refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as above in the heavens. That are you, do you feel secure from the one who is in the heavens? Okay? 
Yeah. Do you feel secure from the one who is in the heavens that he will not cause the earth to swallow you up? So Allah is always referred to someone who is <coughs> in the heavens. And also Allah is referred to someone who sends down okay to us from above the heavens. He sends down send, uh, sends down rain. He's the one who reveals, he sends down the revelation. Okay? Wa ilayhi yasradu kalimu tayyib. To him goes up, yasrud. What does sa'ada mean? Yasrud. In Arabic, it means to climb, to go up. It doesn't mean to go down. To him goes the righteous word, al kalimu tayyib. Right? Bar rafa'ahu ilayhi. Isa alayhi salam. That rather he raised him up, rafa'a. To raise something up, he raised him up to him. There are many, many verses, endless verses in the Quran proving Allah's literal elevation in His essence above the rest of the creation. Evidence from the Sunnah. Yes. The slave girl, the Prophet asked her, and she said, in the heavens. Another evidence. So. This is this is this is from Fitra, okay? But there are more explicit evidences. Allah descends to the lowest, to the lowest heaven, the last third of the night, okay? So if Allah is not above, where will He descend from? And there are many many evidences where obviously of of the companions and the athar from the rest of the salaf about Allah subhanahu wa taala being above the creation. Fitra, <coughs> fitra is our natural instincts. Okay, what proof can 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 you give us with respect to Allah's elevation above the creation from fitra? The universe or the nature. When you look at it. You, you must think how does it come here? There must be a reason. No, fit. Yes, that's about that's about proving that there is God who created you for a purpose. But you're talking about God actually being above. The creation. So when, when a person is in need, let's say he's not a Muslim, let's say he's Sikh, let's say he's Buddhist, whatever. When something happens, why is it that human being, by nature, looks up to the heavens? Yeah. Doesn't matter what your religion is. <coughs> Doesn't matter what your religion is. Yeah. Human being will always look up to the skies. When he finds absolutely no help This is a fact Doesn't matter what you believe in You may look up and say Lord Jesus You may look up and say Lord Krishna You may look up and say whatever But They always believe that God Or the supreme being Is in the heavens Yeah uh, they were, Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah he, once, he was once having an argument With a Jahmi Jahmiyyah Obviously these sort of rationalists They deny that God is in any direction Okay So During The debate With Ibn Taymiyyah Ibn Taymiyyah said something And so Jahmi During the debate He said Ah subhanallah You know And Ibn Taymiyyah stopped And said Hold on Why do you Look up and say Subhanallah If you don't believe That Allah is actually up there Why do you believe That you have to Communicate with someone above you Yeah Why do you think you have to seek help from someone above you That's because we are programmed Whether we like it or not Whether we admit it or not Even if a person is atheist Yeah Scientist Whatever He doesn't believe in any being When it comes to the crunch He would always look up for help We have been programmed to do this And this is the evidence of fitrah this is what many Ash'ari scholars could not overcome. They said, okay, fine, if you don't believe that Allah is in a direction, why do we have this need to turn to the skies for help? This is something they could never overcome. So, <coughs> these are the sort of three types of evidences we have to prove that God is above the creation. The first evidence, obviously, from the Akhil, reason, the Naql. Uh, the, uh, the Islamic text and of obviously the fitrah. Uh, al Allama ibn Abil Izz al Hanafi. Who is his scholar? Ibn Abil Izz al Hanafi. Anybody knows? 
Tahawiyah? Aqidah yeah. Tahawiyah, obviously the author of it is Tahawi. But he's the, he's the commentator on Aqidah Tahawiyah. Aqidah Tahawiyah, dear brothers and sisters, is an, a manual on Islamic Aqidah according to the doctrine of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, as written by a Hanafi scholar of the 3rd or the 4th Islamic century, Al Tahawi. Uh, he, this is something which the you know which majority of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah accepted as a reliable creed. At Tahawi is the one who composed it, and uh, after him, obviously, he's coming from Hanafi school, and Hanafi school was predominantly at, at a time taken over by the Mu'tazila. Later on, it became predominantly uh, contro- under the control of the Maturidis. So, when these people came along, they took this authentic text of At Tahawi, but gave a twisted commentary to it. A twisted commentary that. Obviously, it falls in line with their rationalist school of thought. So, Ibn Abi Liz al-Hanafi, he came, and he, and he came around the time of Ibn Qayyim. He came, he's a companion of Ibn Qayyim as well. And he wrote a Sunni commentary to At-Tahawi's Aqidah. And most of his writing is really based on the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim. While he himself was a Hanafi judge. He himself was a Hanafi judge. And <coughs> his commentary to Tahawiyyah is uh, you know, widely celebrated in the Muslim world. We were taught this ourselves in Dar al-Hadith al-Khairiyyah uh, over a period of three years. Uh, so this is one of the most authoritative, this is one of the most reliable works uh, of the Sunni creed. And it's sort of a, it's it's kind of the school of Ibn Taymiyyah Ibn Qayyim presented in just a couple of volumes. And as something like a, 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 I mean a student of Aqidah will not be considered a proper student unless and until he studies this book thoroughly, page by page. So this is a very important book. Uh, <coughs> the commentary of at Tahawi's Creed. And this is by Ibn Abilaz al-Hanafi. And uh, he says Ibn Abilaz al-Hanafi he says وَعُلُوهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَلَى كَمَا هُوَ ثَابِتٌ بِالسَّمْعِ ثَابِتٌ بِالْعَقْلِ وَالْفِطْرَةِ The ulu of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the elevation of Allah upon his creation is something which is affirmed by the summer which is the textual evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah ثَابِتٌ بِالْعَقْلِ وَالْفِطْرَةِ It is also affirmed by reason and it is also affirmed by fitrah وقال شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية رحمه الله القول بأن الله تعالى فوق العالم معلوم بالاضطرار. The fact that Allah سبحانه وتعالى is above the creation is something known by necessity from the book and the sunnah and the ijma' and the salaf of this ummah. والأحاديث عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وعن الصحابة والتابعين متواترة بذلك. And the ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ and from the Sahaba and the Tabi'ah have reached a level of tawatur. What is, what is the tawatur? What does it mean by mutawatir? Mutawatir. Highest, the top, is a chain of narration where it's been relayed so many times that it cannot be... Uh, Not so many times because you can have one narration which one person heard but then he narrated to many different people many times that is still ahad no. because you're the only person who heard it no. okay. right? Yeah. but let's say if I say something and about 20 people here they relate it from me this is mutawatir if 20 people relate it from me they cannot accuse them all of uh, you know, weak memory you cannot accuse them of, of making something up <coughs> you cannot accuse them all of collaborating a lie against me Collaborating together to invent a lie against me. You can't. Which is why it's called mutawatir. Which is like the highest level of certainty. Right? Because <coughs> all these people can't just get together and scheme against the Prophet ﷺ and invent something which the Prophet ﷺ didn't say. That's what it means. A hadith about the ele- literal elevation of Allah above the creation 
are so many related by so many different companions that nobody could uh, put any doubt over this fact. وَقَالَ أَيْضًا and Ibn Taymiyyah also said وَإِذَا قِيلَ الْعُلُو فَإِنَّهُ يَتَنَاوَلُ مَا فَوْقَ الْمَخْلُوقَاتِ كُلِّهَا فَمَا فَوْقَهَا كُلِّهَا فَمَا فَوْقَهَا كُلُّهَا هُوَ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَلَا يَقْتَضِي هَذَا أَنْ يَكُونَ هُنَاكَ ذَرْفٌ وُجُودِيٌّ يُحِيضُ بِهِ إِذْ لَيْسَ فَوْقَ الْعَالَمِ شَيْءٌ مَوْجُودٍ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Then when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the creation okay, What we mean by that He is literally above everything that exists beyond Him Besides Him He is above everything that exists besides Him him. What doesn't it doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot of people <coughs> the Jahmiya they turn around and say, Oh, that means you saying that Allah is in a space. Allah is confined within a space. If you say that He is above and above is a direction <coughs> and you're confining and you're limiting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within a space. So what Ibn Taymiyyah is saying is that just because he exists in a dimension <coughs> doesn't mean he exists in a created dimension because he exists beyond the realm of the creation altogether. He exists beyond the realm of the creation. He exists, this is tangible. <coughs> and beyond the creation there is nothing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As only the only thing that exists is either the creator or the creation. There is no third category of create of being or existence. There is either the creator or there is the creation. If a thing is not a creator, it is the creation. If it is not creation, it is the creator. So <coughs> anything that is beyond the creation is the creator. So and he also says Bakad Ajma'a Salafu al Umma wa Aimma to Sunnah Ala Isbati Sifat al Istiwa Yal Arsh Dilla Ala al Arshi Lillahi Azza wa Jal the إِسْتِوَاءً يَلِيقُ بِجَلَالِهِ وَكَمَالِهِ بِلَا كَيْفِ the, the, the Salaf of the Ummah and the Imams of the Sunnah <coughs> like Imam Ahmad, like Al-Bukhari and others have all agreed, consensus no disagreement amongst them consensus on the fact <coughs> that uh, the, on, on affirming uh, Sifat Al-Istiwa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rose over the throne Al-Istiwa ala al-Arsh Istiwa'an yaliqu bi jalalihi In a manner which befits his majesty Bila kayf Without asking how Without going into how did Allah rise above the throne <coughs> When he rose above the throne did he vacate his position What position was he Was the throne above him before he rose This is all going into the howness And this is not something we've been obliged to find out about or to question is not something we'll be asked about on the day of judgment what we will be asked about on the day of judgment is believing in what we've been informed the fact that Allah rose over the throne bila kayf not without asking how jama akhbara subhanahu an nafsihi fi sabi ayat the way Allah has explained to us about himself in seven odd verses in the Quran he says ar rahman wa arsh istawa ar rahman the most merciful rose over his throne he also says thumma istawa ala al arsh ar rahman fas'al bihi khabira then then he rose over the throne ar rahman then asked the one fas'al bihi khabira then <coughs> ask by him inna rabbakum allah alladhi khalaqa as samawati wal arda fi sittati ayyam thumma istawa ala al arsh that indeed your Lord is Allah, the one who created the heavens and the earth in six days, and then He rose over the throne. <coughs> Shaykh al Islam Abu Ismail al Sabuni al Shafi'i, he is one of the Shafi'i scholars, and the reason why he's mentioning the Shafi'i scholar because many of the Shafi'is, unfortunately, later on adopted the madhab of Al Ash'ari. They left the madhab of Imam al Shafi'i in Aqidah, although they adhered to it in fiqh. They left the madhab of Imam Shafi'i in Aqidah Which is why now you go to al other University In Egypt You'll find that it's predominantly Ash'ari Predominantly It's 
controlled by the rationalist movement of the Ash'ari school and even though the people are Shafi's in fiqh they do not refer to the creed of Imam Shafi in Aqidah at all so <coughs> he, uh, Imam Sabuni he is one of the early Shafi'i scholars who were still on the Aqidah of Imam Shafi'i and he says وَعُلَمَاءُ الْأُمَّةِ وَأَعْيَانُ الْأَئِمَّةِ مِنَ السَّلَفِ رَحِيمَهُ اللَّهِ لَمْ يَخْتَلِفُوا فِي أَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَلَىٰ عَلَىٰ عَرْشِهِ that the ulama of this ummah and the great personalities from amongst the imams of the salaf <coughs> they did not disagree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his throne وَعَرْشُهُ فَوْقَ سَمَوَاتِهِ and the fact that his arsh, his throne is above his heavens يُثْبِتُونَ لَهُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ مَا أَثْبَتَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ they affirm whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirmed for himself وَيُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَيُصَدِّقُونَ الرَّبَّ جَلَّ جَلَالُهُ فِي خَبَرِهِ and they believe in it and they testify to the truth that comes to them from the Lord وَيُطْلِقُونَ مَا أَطْلَقَهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى they say what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they only utter what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they do not add to it they do not change its meaning or twist the words مِنِ اسْتِوَائِهِ عَلَى الْأَرْشِ the fact that Allah rose of the throne وَيُمِرُّونَهُ عَلَى ظَاهِرِهِ and they allow these texts about Allah being above the throne about Allah creating Adam with his two hands <coughs> and so on and so forth they, they allow these texts to pass according to their apparent meaning without fiddling around with their meanings without twisting their meanings without denying their meanings they just believe in him literally without questioning anything يُمِرُّونَهُ عَلَى ظَاهِرِهِ وَيَكِلُونَ عِلْمَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ and they leave the in-depth knowledge of it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as to what it actually means in reality <coughs> the nature of all these attributes of action and the attributes of essence they leave that all to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they only believe <coughs> in the zahir of what has been written in the Quran and the Sunnah <coughs> one of the Ash'ari scholars Al-Qurtubi Al-Maliki he is someone obviously he doesn't believe that Allah is above the seven heavens and that he's above the throne he doesn't believe that God is in a direction but he says something very interesting he says something very interesting <coughs> and even though he doesn't even believe in this وَقَدْ كَانَ السَّلَفُ الْأَوَّلُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ لَا يَقُولُونَ بِنَفْجِ الْجِهَةِ وَلَا يَمْتَقُونَ بِذَلِكَ that the early Salaf, may Allah be pleased with them, they will not <coughs> deny a direction for Allah. Or they won't say anything like it. بَلْ نَطَقُوهُمْ وَالْكَافَ بِإِثْبَاتِهَا لِلَّهِ تَعَالَىٰ Rather, to the contrary, they will explicitly affirm that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will explicitly affirm a direction for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كَمَا نَطَقَ كِتَابُهُ وَأَخْبَرَتْ رُسُلُهُ The way... We've been informed by his book and the way we've been informed by also his messengers. وَلَمْ يُنْكِرْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ السَّلَفِ الصَّالِحِ أَنَّهُ اسْتَوَى عَلَىٰ عَرْشِهِ حَقِيقَةً No one from the Salaf al-Salih, no one from the pious predecessors ever denied that he literally, حَقِيقَةً In reality, in actual fact, he rose above the throne. وَخَصَّ الْعَرْشَ بِذَلِكْ لِأَنَّهُ أَعْظَمُ مَخْلُقَاتِهِ and the reason why Allah mentioned His throne in particular is because it is the greatest of Allah's creation. وَإِنَّمَا جَهِلُوا كَيْفِيَةَ الْإِسْتِوَاءِ They only were ignorant of the nature of this istiwa. The nature of Allah's rising above the throne. That's the only thing they were ignorant of. فَإِنَّهُ لَا تُعْلَمْ حَقِيقَتُهُ Because there's something that reality of which is not known. قال مالك رحمه الله مالك said الاستواء معلوم الاستواء rising above the throne is known in the لغة in the language of the Arabs والكيف مجهول how he did it the nature of that استواء is مجهول is not known to us 
was su'alu anhu bid'ah and to ask about this nature ask about how is bid'ah is an innovation in religion وَكَذَا قَالَتْ أُمْ سَلَمَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا and Umm Salama the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said the same and Shaykh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah he says وَقَدْ دَخَلَ فِي مَا ذَكَرْنَاهُ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ بِاللَّهِ الْإِيمَانُ بِمَا أَخْبَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ فِي كِتَابِهِ وَتَوَاتَرَ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وأجمع عليه سلف الأمة من أنه سبحانه فوق سماواته على عرشه <coughs> that amongst the things that we are required to believe in that we are required to believe in with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Imanu Bima Akhbar Allah Bihi Fi Kitabihi that is to have faith in what Allah has told us about in His book and that which has been reported from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which has reached the level of Tawatur and which the Salaf of this Ummah have completely agreed upon مِنْ أَنَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ فَوْقَ سَمَوَاتِهِ عَلَىٰ عَرْشِهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the heavens and above his throne عَلِيٌّ عَلَىٰ خَلْقِهِ Elevated above his creation وَهُوَ مَعُهُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كَانُوا And he is also with them wherever they may be يَعْلَمُ مَا هُمْ عَمِلُونَ He knows exactly what they are doing كَمَا جَمَعَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ فِي قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَىٰ <coughs> and both the, both of these things have been mentioned in this verse uh, obviously both of these things we're referring here to Allah's literal elevation above his creation and the fact that he's with us <coughs> in his knowledge when Allah says huwa alladhi khalaq as-samawati wal arda fi sittati ayyamin thumma istawa 'ala al-arsh ya'lamu ma yalaju fi al-ard wa ma yakhruju minha wa ma yanzilu min as-samaa'i wa ma ya'ruju fiha وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ That he, it is he who has created the heavens and the earth in six days ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشِ And then he rose over the throne يَعْلَمُ مَا يَلَجُ فِي الْأَرْضِ He knows what goes into the earth وَمَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْهَا And what comes out of it وَمَا يَنْزِلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ He knows what comes down from the heavens وَمَا يَعْرُجُ فِيهَا And what goes up to it وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ and he is with you wherever you may be. Wallahu bima ta'amaluna basir. And Allah knows, Allah can see all that you do. Walaysa ma'ana qawlihi wa huwa ma'akum annahum mukhtalatun bil khalq. Allah saying here wa huwa ma'akum that he is with you. It doesn't mean that he is intermingling in the creation. That he is mixed with the creation. Fa inna hadha la tujibuhu al-lugha. That something like that is not even necessitated by the Arabic language. وَهُوَ خِلَافُ مَا أَجْمَعَ عَلَيْهِ سَلَفُ الْأُمَّةِ And that is in opposition to what the Salaf of this Ummah have agreed upon. وَخِلَافُ مَا فَطَرَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْخَلْقِ And it is obviously against, in its contradiction to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created our natural instincts. Because our natural instincts tell us to refer to the heavens when we want something of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To, and therefore to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mixed in the atmosphere and the environment around us goes against our fitrah not to mention that it goes against the Quran and the sunnah and not to mention that the lugha it doesn't even dictate that the, the Arabic language and even the English language if you know if, if let's say your brother is with me on the phone <coughs> and he's trying to you know, explain something to me and he says to me you with me? Yeah. And I say, yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you. What does that mean? Understand. I understand. Okay, it doesn't mean I'm literally right, sitting right next to him. Okay? A brother wants my support. I say, can I do this? I say, go ahead bro, I'm with you. What does it mean? I'm supporting you. I'm backing you. Okay? <coughs> so this is what it means. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنِّي مَعَكُمَا أَسْمَعُ وَأَرَى To Musa and Harun I am with you Hearing and seeing Meaning he's with them With his help And he's with them with his sight This is what language dictates It does not dictate At all that Allah is literally Right next to uh, His creation Or he mixed in his creation Not at all وَكُلُّ مَا سَبَقَ ذِكْرُهُ مِنْ أَنْوَاعِ التَّوْحِيدِ فِي الرُّبُوبِيَّةِ وَالْإِلَاهِيَّةِ وَالْأَسْمَاءِ وَالصِّفَاتِ وَالْحَاكِمِيَّةِ دَاخِلٌ فِي شَهَدَةِ الْعَبْدِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ 
so the author here, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Al Khaliq, he says that everything that we have previously mentioned from the different types of Tawheed in Rububiya, in Ilahiya, and Asma, and Sifat, and Hakimiya, all of that, <coughs> all of that is included in the Shahada when a person testifies to La ilaha illallah. There is no one worthy of worship except one Allah. Um, what we'll do inshallah is, uh, is uh, we'll, we'll get started with the next because we've got another 15 minutes so we'll get started with the next section here and this section is very important <coughs> the section here is titled Tahqiq Tawheed Bi Ikhlas al Lillah Actualizing, Realizing Tawheed by purifying the deen for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because believing is one thing living is something else believing and being able to say in parrot fashion that Tawheed is three categories Uluhiya, Rububiya and Asma Sifat is one thing and living this Tawheed actualizing and realizing it in your life is something else and this is why <coughs> the companions and the prophets they all knew Tawheed but for them, it was a constant reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about Tawheed. Okay, even though all these people had accepted Islam, what is the wisdom behind the Prophet sallallahu saying to Ma'az bin Jabal, who is, uh, you know, sitting behind him on a mule? You know, what's the point of him reminding him about the right of Allah upon his slave, that they, sh- they should not worship anyone but him? Why the constant reminder of Tawheed? Why the constant reminder of Tawheed to the Prophet sallallahu in the Qur'an? Because Tawheed is not something which you study in the beginning or a key with which you enter Islam and then you throw away the key. No. It's not something <coughs> you start in the beginning and then you move on to other areas of religion. It's not something you study. Okay, I've studied Tawheed now. Let's put it aside now. Open up a book on Fiqh. Let's open up a book on Usul. Let's open up... No. Tawheed is something... That you start And with that You move on to other Subjects You don't leave that subject behind And move on to other subjects Rather With that subject You move on to other subjects So you study Surah Fiqh in light of Tawheed You study Fiqh in light of Tawheed Tawheed encompasses every aspect of religion And that's what it means Actualizing Tawheed in your life Actualizing Tawheed <coughs> In Everything that you do And for this reason One of the most important aspects of Tawheed That many Muslims tend to miss out Are things, are, are those aspects that are to do with our practical lives Aspects of Tawheed to do with Khashia Fearing nobody except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Relying upon Him Okay Haqqa tawakkul uh, حق التوكل, relying up on him when there is nobody else to rely on except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay fearing him above, above everyone else loving him above everyone else having true taqwa for him this is a sort of tawheed which is practical tawheed okay <coughs> it's all well and good learning about the fact that we should not fear anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's another thing when it actually comes to the crunch and you're faced with a situation where you know the forces of kufr they demand from you compromise okay they promise you all the glitter of this world and this is and if you don't tell their line they promise you all the sort of suffering that that they have for you in this world they promise you torture they promise you imprisonment they promise you defamation they promise you many things and this is the real test where a person says, you know what, I fear Allah more than I fear these people. So I'm not going to compromise my religion. This is Tawheed. And when it comes to the crunch, you see many people actually fail in this aspect of Tawheed. Then this is the sort of Tawheed that even Allah reminded the Muslims about. أَتَخْشَوْنَهُمْ فَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَن تَخْشَوْهُ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Is it because you really fear these kuffar? <coughs> is it because you fear the mushrikeen? Isn't Allah more deserving of being feared by you if you truly are believers? This was a this is like practical tawheed 
which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always reminded his companions about. So this is a sort of tawheed that really, really matters. So, <coughs> the Shaykh says, وَمِن تَحْقِيقِ التَّوْحِيد To realize that tawheed, completion of this tawheed, أَنْ يَعْلَمَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَلَىٰ أَثْبَتَ لَهُ حَقًّا لَا يُشْرِكُ فِيهِ مَخْلُوقٍ كَالْعِبَادَةِ وَالتَّوَكُّلِ وَالْخَوْفِ وَالْخَشْيَةِ وَالتَّقْوَىٰ that he has reserved certain rights for himself in which none of his creation take part like al-ibadah so nobody is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like at-tawakkul <coughs> the ibadah of tawakkul tawakkul itself is ibadah relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay instead of uh, uh, you know, instead of doing something haram to achieve, uh, uh, you know, short-term benefits. Wal khawf, fear of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Wal khawf wal khashya, fear of Allah subhanahu wa taala above everyone else, and fear of Him from your own sins. Wat taqwa, and of course, being God conscious at all times. Kama qala taala, as Allah subhanahu wa taala has said, La taj'al ma Allahi ilahan akhar. فَتَقْعُدَ مَذْمُومًا مَخْذُولًا Do not make with Allah another ilah. Do not make with Allah another God so that you end up sitting in a state of uh, in a state of uh, censure, مَذْمُوم in, in a state of guilt, in a state of uh, you know, failure. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ فَاعْبُدِ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصًا لَهُ الدِّينِ Indeed we have revealed to you the book with truth فَاعْبُدِ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصًا لَهُ الدِّينِ Then worship Allah Not only worship Allah مُخْلِصًا لَهُ الدِّينِ While purifying the religion for him What does Linguistically what does the word ikhlas mean? Who knows? Ikhlas Sincerity Sincerity, yes But uh, I mean, it's called sincerity because of it, the linguistic roots of the word Yeah, ikhlas Just linguistically, what does it mean? Sorry? The ikhlas If you have milk And you mix it up with water as it happens in Muslim countries, they mix it up with water to obviously uh, increase their sale, increase the money, increase the revenue. <coughs> this is not ikhlas. Ikhlas is if you were to have pure, yeah, pure to purify something. When you get gold, obviously, when you dig out gold and so on, <coughs> you don't just sell it just like that. When you get when you get oil, for instance. You don't sell it just like that, the way you extract it from the earth. No, you have to refine it. And the different, different levels of refinement of oil. Yeah? That, so, it's unrefined. And what it means basically, getting all the sort of unpleasant elements out and purifying and purifying and purifying until you have the purest substance. That's what it means. Purifying the religion from things that do not belong there. Okay, but whether it be your intention or anything else. Sorry? Yes. Alone, 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 as I said, when it comes to tawakkul, you know, when it comes to khawf and khashya and these sort of things. This is the real test of tawheed. 
And if it wasn't for this aspect of Tawheed The companions of the Prophet ﷺ would not have been successful Really If they didn't have this aspect of Tawheed Why would they suffer for three years? Boycott Just living on leaves and stuff Why? Okay And the reason why we are not successful Is because we don't have that level of Tawakkul And Khashia We very easily compromise our religion Anything We don't want to have tawakkul upon Allah Azza wa Jal So what if they take our jobs away So what if they take opportunity away You know Are we gonna you know, Why sacrifice, why compromise What happened to tawakkul Okay All of that is That is what sets apart Serious people From You know people who just like to profess faith by tongue What's the difference between zakat and ikhlas? Zakat. Uh, I mean, zakat is more general. You know, if if you zakat tazkiyah, for instance, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's like a difference between washing something, okay? And ikhlas is more sort of like taking ingredients. Unpleasant ingredients from the object out it, You know that is more sort of like More of a thorough process, process. Okay I mean you wouldn't say You know extracting oil and tazkiyah for instance By getting all the impurities out of the oil And making it refined But you will call it ikhlas Because you are literally Changing the nature of it altogether from within By extracting certain elements From it Okay, zakat is like basically is like making khusul yeah, tazkiyah in that sense. But ikhlas is more, which is why Allah uses the word yuzakihim also purify. But ikhlas is is more deep in that sense. In the surah al-ikhlas, qulhu Allahu ahad. It's called surah al-ikhlas. <coughs> so Allah also says, qul inni. Umirtu an Abdullah Mukhlis al Lahuddin. Say I have been ordered to worship Allah Mukhlis al Lahuddin. Be Mukhlis in the religion. Purify the religion for him alone. Waqala ta'ala, Qul afaghir Allah ta muruni a'abuda ayyuhal jahilun. Now is it other than Allah you asking me, you ordering me to worship, to to serve, O oh, you ignorant people. وَكُلُّمْ مِنْ الرُّسُلْ يَقُولْ لِقَوْمِهِ يَعْمُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ اللَّهِ الْغَيْرُ That all of the messengers would also say to their people Worship Allah, you have no ilah apart from Him So for example, he says about tawakkul وَقَدْ قَالَ تَعَالَ فِي التَّوَكُلْ وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَتَوَكَّلُوا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ And make tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you are truly believers وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ and let the believers make tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَقَالْ قُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ يَتَوَكَّلُ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ That say Allah is sufficient for me And upon him the mutawakkilun make tawakkul And Allah also says وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ رَضُوا مَا أَتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ سَيُؤْتِينَ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَرَسُولُهُ إِنَّا إِلَى اللَّهِ رَاغِبُونَ that <coughs> but the hypocrites, if they were pleased with what Allah and His Messenger gave to them, and they said, وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهِ they said Allah is sufficient for us. They didn't say Allah and His Messenger is sufficient for us. Yeah, they said Allah is sufficient for us. That kind of tawakkul. Even though they said that if they, uh, the verse says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ only if they, رَضُوا مَا أَتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ only if they were pleased with what Allah and His Messenger gave. Okay, he mentioned both Allah and His Messenger. But when it comes to tawakkul and relying upon Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah only mentioned Himself. Waqalu hasbun Allah. Allah is sufficient for us. He didn't say Allah and His Messenger are sufficient for us, but Allah alone. Sayyutin Allahu min fadlihi wa rasuluhu inna ila Allahi raqibun. That Allah and His Messenger will give us from His fadl and we are uh, uh, interested in the reward. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So <coughs> this sort of tawakkul Is what uh, 
helps us understand what Tawheed implies. Uh, <coughs> the Hasb is mentioned in this verse. The Al Hasb Fahu Al Kafi. Al Hasb is the one who is actually sufficient for you. Whenever you have a need, whenever you have any want, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill that need for you and He will be the only one to fulfill that need for you. Wallahu wahdahu kafin abda. Kama qala ta'ala, Allah alone is the one who is sufficient for His servants. As Allah says in the Quran, Alladina qala lahum un nasu inna nasa qad jama'u lakum fakhshawhum fazadahum imana wa qalu hasbun Allahu wa ni'ma al wakil. Fahuwa wahdahu hasbuhum kulluhum. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسِ إِنَّ النَّاسِ قَدْ جَمَعُ لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُمْ This is a practical example of the Tawheed of Tawakkul Dear brothers Okay So you can take this instance And relate it to in your own lives And see okay If I were to be in this situation How would I be able to practice my Tawakkul Allah says الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسِ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُ لَكُمْ فَاخْشَوْهُمْ That <coughs> the people, the believers to whom all the rest of the people they say النَّاسِ قَدْ جَمَعُ لَكُمْ The people have all gathered against you فَاخْشَوْهُمْ So fear them Go back into your homes فَزَادَهُمْ imana. But instead of sort of crushing the morale Instead of making them Fear all the people that are gathering around to finish them off Zadahum imana It only increased them in their faith Increased them in their faith Waqalu And they said Hasbun Allahu ni'man wakim They said Allah suffices us Allah is sufficient for us We don't care how many people come against us So long as Allah is sufficient for us Wa ni'man wakil And he's the best disposer of affairs Now that's something When was this When was this revealed? What incident is this verse talking about? Yes, Ahzab. <coughs> Ahzab. What happened, you see? In the battle of Ahzab, the Arab tribes, they all got together to finish off Islam once and for all. And they did that by obviously forming this coalition of the willing from amongst the Arab tribes got them all together and said this guy Muhammad he's a pain and we're going to sort him out we're going to wipe them all off and no we're not going to attack them just from one side in Medina we're going to surround them we're going to have a blockade nothing going in nothing coming out until these people surrender and give up or we're going to just go and launch all our attack on the, on the city and destroy them all When this happened Obviously this, this is a grand plan Something like that Especially Arab armies all coming together Arabs they are always fighting each other They will never come together for anything But all Arab armies coming together Uniting for once in their history To fight against Islam In these sort of circumstances The allied tribes that existed in Medina Obviously the Jewish tribes They thought this is the opportunity The Muslims are definitely going to be finished Why? Because all they could see Is The material forces They couldn't see the They didn't even believe in the, the forces of the unseen That belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala All they could see is the, the Arab armies marching on towards Medina And they were Confident That they are going to run over Medina so confident they said they thought they can ditch the Muslims, betray them, and go and ally with the Arabs outside and say, you know what? We're gonna help you crush Muhammad and his companions. This is what happened. <coughs> and people as they were digging the trenches, there was so much fear amongst them. Obviously it was blockade, there was no food coming in, going out, and people in that sort of circumstances were digging the trenches. You imagine, not only that they had no water, no food, but they also had to dig the trenches around Medina for the whole city, not the whole city, but one side of the city. Because the other, I think, in three, from three sides is covered by mountains, as far as I understand. Only one side 
is basically open to attack from the enemy. So on that side they were digging the trenches. And the Prophet ﷺ obviously had two stones tied to his stomach because of hunger. I've never felt that hungry in my entire life that I had to tie anything to my stomach. So I cannot, I'm sure most of us haven't felt that sort of hang- hunger where we had to actually tie two or even one or tie absolutely anything to our stomachs. But that was the kind of hunger <coughs> they had to go through. And not only that, when the Prophet ﷺ was digging the trenches, uh, you know, they, they came across a stone which the Sahaba couldn't break. So they had to get the Prophet ﷺ. And as he struck this stone, he was given a vision that, you know, he, that uh, the Muslims have conquered Persia. And then he struck another, and then he was given a vision that the Muslims have conquered Rome. And he related what he saw to the companions. And you can imagine, at that time, the Prophet ﷺ is told, you're going to conquer Rome and Persia. You know? And the companions, they go around and the news spreads amongst them. The Prophet ﷺ said, we're going to conquer Rome and Persia. What do the Munafiqun do? Who knows? Munafiqeen, what do they do? They said, you don't even feel safe going to the toilet. He's telling us about... Yeah, there you are, the whole army of the Arabs have uh, masqueraded against you, <coughs> okay, um, they, they have, uh, not masqueraded, but surrounded you, okay, <coughs> they're all against you, you are too afraid now to even go to the toilet, and there's your prophet telling you that you're going to be sitting over the treasures of the Roman and the Persian emperors. Okay, so what the munafiqeen they were doing at that time and the munafiqeen they always do this they always try to demoralize the people they always, they are very negative people they always try to weaken the resolve of the believers they always try to like paint a very bleak picture of what's going on don't worry, you are all going to go down you might as well go back into your homes okay, these guys are going to come and kill you and if you want to save yourselves don't put up any resistance don't put up any fight because if you fight them they're going to come back you know and, and they're going to bomb you same sort of thing happens in Muslim countries okay <coughs> don't go and fight against the occupiers because if you shoot once towards the occupiers they bomb the whole village so, so don't retaliate don't resist give in and let it be and you get many of these munafiqeen saying exactly the same so in, the, in these sort of circumstances, when the hypocrite said to the believers, can't you see the facts on the ground? You are, set, you are cornered. Practically speaking, it has to be a miracle to, slay, to save you. And the hypocrites obviously don't believe in miracles. They don't even believe the prophet is in, in fact a prophet of God. So all the odds are against you. The only thing that makes logical sense is for you to put up uh, with this and just basically go back into your homes don't resist let them be, go back into your homes and at that time the believers had absolutely nothing to say to the hypocrites except tawakkul now this is the real test of tawheed this is the real test of tawheed and if they were if the sahaba were people like us what would they have done? give up well, you're right, subhanAllah, they're going to come, let's, let's go out and shake hands and negotiate. Okay? Let's make a deal. Let's compromise. Let's live together in peace and harmony. Let's secure our rights and so on and so forth. And obviously they wouldn't be able to either live in peace and harmony or secure any of their rights. Nothing. They would have lost absolutely everything. But you see, they were ready for these sort of things because they were nurtured in Mecca. <coughs> in Mecca, as I said, they had to go through three years of boycott. They didn't turn around and say, well, you know, you don't have to be so vocal about your faith. You don't have to be like going around like a madman calling people to la ilaha illallah. You don't have to tell them they're going to hellfire. Just tell them in a nice way that, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you worship one God? You know. But, but the way the Prophet ﷺ preached his message was very clear. وَبَشْتِرُكُمْ <laughs> بِالنَّارِ that's, that's all he said. 
you and your forefathers are kuffar and you're going to hell and obviously they didn't like it you know but the early Muslims were not only taught this Tawheed of Rububiyya and Uluhiyya as now Sifa they were taught living Tawheed basically especially when it comes to the crunch will you have the guts to put your entire tawakkul upon Allah Azza wa Jal or will you sell out will you cop out this is Tawheed and this we're going to be studying inshallah it's very important a lot of people just, just basically gloss over it you know think okay we only fear Allah we only love Allah but everyone else next topic you know this is something that should be with us all the time every second of the day and whatever you do workplaces time for salah what are you going to do are you going to tell him that you have to go and pray or are you going to be shy and you're going to say um, yeah, I just have to pop out for a bit now. <laughs> you know I thought I'll go later you know see, see, things as simple as that Things as simple as that. These sort of tawheed is something you find many Muslims failing on a daily basis. Yeah? Subhanakallahumma bihamdi shawla la ilaha wa sallam wa sallam wa sallam wa sallam wa sallam I just made the dua for the circle but you can ask your questions inshallah. <laughs> yes? Uh, I'll read more into that ya akhi inshallah. Al khawf Um, khawf when it comes to uh, it's u- uh, uh, Khawf and khashia to be honest Is usually mentioned uh, In the Quran uh, With respect to fearing Allah Above everyone else Both khawf and khashia uh, so, But I'll, I'll, I'll need to read upon it more to, to tell you exactly what the difference is Between khawf and khashia <laughs> yes. The linguistic meaning of the class is to purify. You know, to get rid of uh, things or the, the, the objects that you don't want to exist in that thing. So if there's water in milk to purify, basically get all the water out until it remains pure milk. If you extract oil, you refine it to get all the unpleasant stuff out of that oil until it becomes pure oil. That How does it apply to the surah? To? The surah al-ikhlas? The surah al-ikhlas? Because that uh, ikhlas meaning you're purifying your worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ لَمْ يُلَدْ So if you look at every single verse, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say He is one. Allahu Samad, He is... Uh, so when you say, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Allah is one, you are purifying His oneness from anything else that may exist. You know, in terms of people believing in multiple deities and so on. Allahu Samad, that He is self-sufficient. So you're purifying him from the fact, uh, from uh, belief that he needs us, or that he uh, he needs our worship, or he needs any of the actions that we do towards him, and so on. As the way the, the you know, it says, God is thought of in the Christian world is someone who can fight with the messengers, and David fought God and sort of defeated him in a battle. You know, these sort of things in, in a wrestling match, apparently. You know, Allah is way above that. Uh, he is not, uh, meaning he is self sufficient and <coughs> he is not in need of any of his creation, and the entire creation is in need of him. Uh, uh, he doesn't give birth, nor is he begotten. He doesn't beget, nor is he begotten. And there is absolutely none like unto him. So if you look at every single verse, of this surah is just purifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what he really is and what he really deserves. Yeah? Also, in regards to hope and uh, 
that we learned was uh, like hopeful gods is just like natural fear, like fear that a person have naturally. Whereas Kashya refers to fear that a person would, would have actual like certain I don't know if you know anything about that nature or so Kofi is just natural fear. Like the person in the jungle when the lion jumps out and then you know, the roars and stuff. The person would be afraid. But whereas the person didn't know what a gun was and he pointed at him. He, he couldn't know. So, so that Kofi was natural fear, Kasha was fear of black like, knowledge. And I think the effect of the Kashya, Allah Ramadan as well, that it creates that sort of sense of awe in terms of Allah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the khawf and khashya are used in the same sort of context in the Quran. Fala takhafuhum wa khafun. Do not fear them, fear me. Yakshawnahum ka khashyatillah. They fear them as they should fear Allah. So, very similar context. So, I don't know. Allah alam. Might be right. I mean, linguistically, it might be right. Uh, quite long. Hmm? That, it's been quite long. Yeah? It? Yeah, just to do the commentary. It goes further into the linguistical differences and also the uh, differences in implementation for the example that you give. Ibn Rasameen, sir? No. Okay, inshallah. Well, you must be right then, yeah. Ibn Rasameen. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know if we just wanted to give like a last word on talking about Tawheed or Tawakkul, Khawf Khashya That's what many of us say we aspire to be du'at or you know we want to enter the fields of da'wah I mean just in regards to uh, Tawheed in these aspects then if you want to just give like a little summary of what we really want to expect and why we kind of touched on it already but why uh, having Tawheed of these aspects why important especially for those people involved in da'wah yeah I mean really <coughs> because you know people involved in da'wah are the, at the forefront of the movement which means they're going to get the brunt of it all before anyone else gets it they're the, they're the ones who are liaising with or working with other kuffar bodies outside so they will be the first point of contact and if they're the ones who keep firm then the rest of the Muslim ummah keeps firm if they compromise, the rest of the Muslim Ummah follows. So that sort of responsibility on them is a the great responsibility on their shoulders. And if they're not fully, firmly grounded in Tawheed of Tawakkul, then you cannot expect the rest of the Ummah to be firmly grounded in Tawakkul. And really, a person who's going to be uh, taking a leading position in Dawah, uh, he, he, he literally means putting yourselves in the shoes of the Prophet Sallallahu You've got to be ready to sacrifice all the things that the Prophet Sallallahu was ready to sacrifice. That includes <coughs> the, what the sacrifices the Prophet Sallallahu made. Let's list them and attach them to Tawheed, for instance. Huh? Before that, before that, reputation, reputation, the Prophet. One of the first, what, look, the Prophet Sallallahu when he lived before he received messengerhood, yeah, messengership or prophethood. The only thing he was known for, really, not the only thing, but one of the most prominent things he was known for is what? As Sadiq al Amin, the most truthful person and the most trustworthy person in Makkah. So it was a matter of reputation for him, yeah, and for him. To then stand up and call the people to one God and say that the religion you are upon is all nonsense and that you're going to hell if you don't follow me. Yeah? He put his reputation at risk and he got a lot of negative publicity for it. So what were the things that he was called? He was a madman. Madman, poet, magician, everything, anything. And there will be people who actually be preventing the outsiders from Makkah to you know from actually going sitting down with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to see what he has to say they will be like following them and say don't listen to this guy don't listen to this guy don't. you know they will be so mad <coughs> to make sure that nobody listens to what he has to say so his negative reputation was all over the place you ask any Makkah about Muhammad he will tell you this guy is a suicide this guy is this and that and so on 
So that's one of the first that was one of the first things to go. Reputation. One of the first things to go. <coughs> then what happened in Taif? He used stoned. He bled. Right? That that was of the physical attack now. We're talking about bleeding for the sake of Allah. Right? Many of us many of us really thinking about practically we won't be able to get over the sec- reputation sacrifice. Let alone getting beaten up physically for the sake of Allah. Yeah? Then <coughs> when it comes to for instance uh, let's say if you were to go and pray and someone were to come and like drop intestines all over us. Okay? We wouldn't do that knowing that someone's going to do it. We wouldn't do that. If you look at the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, when they embraced Islam, the Prophet ﷺ, out of compassion for them, he will tell them, keep it to yourself. At the moment Islam is very weak. Go back to your family, your tribe, and preach them Islam. And one, once we are stronger, you can come back and join us. And that was Abu Darda as far as I remember in particular. What happened? Was Abu Darda Abu Dhar? Abu Dhar. What happened? He said, okay. He left the Prophet's company, went to the middle of the Kaaba. And he said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. got beaten up. He did exactly the opposite of what the Prophet ﷺ advised him to do. Because he was so eager to proclaim his faith, to tell the people. Okay? He, you know, his first meeting with the Prophet ﷺ, he understood it's not just about La ilaha illallah, saying it, believing in it. It's about getting beatings for it. So he went there and he got beaten up. He came back to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I told you, if you do this, this will happen. So go back <coughs> to your family. What happened? Did he listen? No. He went back again to the Kaaba and he said the same. And he got beaten up for the second time. So, if something like this were to happen in our time, how would we react to that? How would we react to that? Honestly, if a person were to go out, you know, in the middle of the street with a megaphone and say, La ilaha illallah. Astaghfirullah, brother, this is not how you give da'wah. <laughs> right? That's how you react to them, unfortunately. Um, you know, just a, a little while ago, you know, on the internet, someone put this clip up on YouTube. Um, there were some uh, native, you know, indigenous Welsh people. Going into Tesco's and trashing the whole, you know, supermarket, you know, because the, some of the products that they were selling over there are actually grown in, we, in the West Bank, and it is illegal for them to grow these sort of products in occupied territory and then sell them, according to international law. It's illegal. So these guys, they walked into the, you know, kuffar, white indigenous Welsh people, walked into Tesco's and start just trashing the place <coughs> until the police came and just escorted them away. You know, and the people on the Islamic forum, they watch this video and say, MashaAllah, that was so nice, these people are so nice, may Allah guide them to Islam and blah blah blah, the rest of it. And I said to myself, you know, imagine, if these people were dark-skinned Muslims, you wouldn't be saying the same. You would be saying like, Astaghfirullah, this is no hikmah, this is not what you do, Astaghfirullah. But just because they're white, middle class, Welsh people, sorry, <laughs> middle class aside, <laughs> just because they're white Welsh, <laughs> you know, we just clap the hands. It's, it's because really, we've not only that we have forgotten the nature of the Prophet's dawah, we've also had a sort of complex, inferiority complex, that we think low of ourselves. That if a white man does this. MashaAllah, but if a brown man, Muslim guy does the same thing, he's like, Astaghfirullah. No. There is something for us to think, I'm obviously not suggesting going anywhere, trashing any place, by the way, just in case uh, anyone gets the wrong idea. But I'm just saying, just generally, <coughs> generally speaking, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ felt the urgency of delivering the message to the people. And they did it. They felt the urgency of the fire of hell. And really that was the mission, saving people. The mission wasn't condemning people, it was saving people. And the Prophet ﷺ, he did his best to, he even made dua for someone like Abu Jahl. You know, 
but uh, when when he said that either Umar or Abu Jahl should accept Islam, uh, he even made dua for a person like that, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala chose Umar. Uh, but the, the fact that he he had he had this sense of urgency to get people to convert to Islam and save their souls from the fire of hell, and this is sort of urgency. If we had, we will have the same sort of mindset that people will start calling us madmen, you know. People start calling us, this guy is complete majnoon. The only thing he's talking about is the fire of hell. You know. But this is the reality. And if we really truly believe in it, and if we really and truly can see the hereafter through that curtain, the way the companions saw it, we will have this sense of urgency. And we will be walking around the street like madmen, trying to save people from the fire of hell. So, if you want to be a person who carries the message of Islam is going to come with a lot of responsibilities it's going to come with a lot of pain it's going to come with a lot of sacrifice you will have to, if you think you're just a money oriented person you will have to put that to the side not saying that you should put your family on the dole, no at the same time it's a double edged sword you, you, not only that you have to feed your family okay you will have to sort of give priority to everything else above that as well and you can't even sort of live on the dole, especially as a person who's calling the people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, I'm not saying it's haram for you to live on the dole, but a person as a dying, you should try not to live on any sort of handout from anyone. So these sort of things, and obviously tawakkul, when it comes to the crunch, when people, I mean, it's really, it's a matter of, it comes down to having a very strong personality, because a lot of people, unfortunately, because Talab M just like a culture, you know, rock star culture nowadays, anyone can just go to Medina and learn. Even people with weak personalities. And people with weak personalities are like basically very very weak utensil. You put lots of water in it and a little bit of knock and everything just shatters. Okay? We what we want people with like basically strong personality, strong vessels. So no matter how much they knocked about, they retain that water. That water is Islam. So if you want to take that responsibility, you've got to make sure your, your personality is nurtured on Tawheed. Not the Tawheed that we all can parrot, you know, Uluhiyya, Rububiyya, Sifat, but Tawheed that we actually live. That we fear Allah above everyone else. That we don't give up our brothers and surrender them to the, to the Kuffar. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us not to. <coughs> that we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above everyone else, especially if we're in charge of communities. We do not sell our communities away. We do not sell our deen to politicians who want to come and use our premises to sell their political secular agendas. All of these sort of things. If you want to be community leaders, obviously you have to be well versed not only in Islam, but you have to have this strong personality. To be able to sacrifice one day, even if it comes to the crunch, to be able to sacrifice the center, because Islam is greater than the center. Sacrifice this building, because Islam is greater than the building. All these sort of things. This sort of mentality people need to have. That the message that they're carrying is much greater, much greater than their own lives, than their own reputation, than their own blood and wealth, and their own family. That's the crux of the matter. خلاص إن شاء الله جزاكم الله خير وأتصبح عليكم الله ورحمة الله وبركاته إلى الله أستغفرك وإليك